Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smutes here with one final video of actual Apes content review. We're less than 24 hours away now, it's almost here, but this video is gonna walk you through five must-know concepts for each unit. So these are vocab terms and concepts that you have to be familiar with. There's a really high likelihood of some of these being on the exam. And I'll also try to point out for each of these where I think they could hit you with an experimental design question and where they might hit you with a propose a solution question. First though, before we get into the content, I just wanna say thank you. The support on the last video I uploaded with the FRQ strategies has just been overwhelming. It's been so cool to see all of you guys prepping for the exam, checking out those strategies and leaving great feedback. So I really appreciate that. If you want to leave in the comments below where you're studying from, I'm in Michigan. I saw a couple other people, someone with the Lions picture for their little uh, profile there. And so I know some of you are in Michigan too, so that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, just leave a comment below where are you taking the exam from tomorrow and you know, send people some positive wishes for good scores. So before we jump into the five concepts that you need to know for each topic, I wanna point out that that five hour cram finale on Fiveable, the stream should be available, the replay of the stream I should say, for free. I believe you can watch that stream replay afterwards. So this link that is built into the slides I'm showing you here. The slides will be linked in the description below. So make sure to go down there. Make sure to subscribe too while you're down there and uh, give this video a like if it was helpful. But that's just a great resource that you can check out and that should be free. I think they only charge you to watch it during the actual live stream. So like I said, we'll be getting right into it here. Five major topics from each unit that you really should be familiar with. High likelihood that some of these are going to be on the exam. And then make sure you get eight hours of sleep uh, the last thing you want to do is be really tired and spend all night cramming tonight. Be fresh going to that exam. Avoid lots of sugar. You know, have a well-balanced meal so that you're not all jittery and kind of crashing come 4 p.m. at least Eastern time for us. So I know we're not used to taking exams super late in the afternoon like that. And so something you want to be mindful of. So here we go. Here are five must-know concepts from unit one. Competition and symbiosis. These are ways that organisms interact. Remember that competition is organisms basically fighting for a resource that they need. And symbiosis is just anytime organisms live in really close proximity. It could be beneficial for both. That'd be mutualism. So we have a honeybee and a flower here. Great example of that. Then we have wetlands. Wetlands are super productive biomes. They have a ton of plant growth, support a ton of animal life. They can take on a lot of excess water during storms. So they provide a ton of ecosystem services to humans. They're very, very important biomes globally. Then we have carbon reservoir sink or sequestration. Really important to understand the carbon cycle. Reservoirs are areas that store carbon for a period of time and sinks are areas that can store increasing amounts of carbon. Sequestration is just the act of storing carbon. So trees can sequester carbon, but carbon can also be sequestered for a really long time in fossil fuels underneath the ground. The ocean is also another reservoir for carbon because it can take the carbon in. It can also be stored as sediments in the bottom of the ocean. So those are really important terms when it relates to the carbon cycle. Then we have the water cycle. So you should know what runoff is, just water that hits impervious surface and washes away to another location. Evaporation is of course when water goes from a liquid to a gas and that's an important process in the water cycle. And then finally infiltration, often overlooked, but that's water trickling through the ground or through the soil pore space to recharge the groundwater beneath it. Then we have ecosystem productivity. So that is the total amount of energy that's coming into an ecosystem from the sun. The amount of energy that's harvested by the plant is referred to as gross primary productivity, but then the plant has to use some of that energy for respiration. And so what's left available to the consumers that eat the plant is net primary productivity. So each of these key concepts here are linked. You'll notice that those blue links will take you to another eight to 10 minute video. So obviously you don't have time to watch every single one of these between now and the exam. But what I might do is for each of the seven units, pick my weakest topic and watch the short eight to 10 minute video lecture on that topic so that you can try to make sure you cover as many of these big, really important concepts as possible. Now on to unit two, we have biodiversity. So genetic species and ecosystem. Remember these are the three ways that we measure biodiversity. Biodiversity is good because it makes populations more resistant to disturbance and makes ecosystems more likely to recover from a disturbance. Then we have ecosystem services. So I've got the little money sign here because remember that ecosystem services 
are things that have monetary value to humans than nature does for free. So the example of the wetlands storing excess water that lessens storm damage, great example of an ecosystem service. Then we have invasive species. These are species that are not native to an area. They're typically introduced by humans and we don't want them there because they drive down biodiversity. They typically outcompete the natives. So we've got the little lady that says no invasive species and the zebra mussel is a great example of an invasive species. Then we have adaptation and evolution. Differences in DNA are going to provide genetic diversity amongst the population. That is the source material for evolution. So the more genetically diverse, the more likely a population is to have some members that have beneficial adaptations that allow them to survive and eventually as a species evolve. Then we have keystone species. These are really important organisms who basically hold the fabric of an ecosystem together. Without them, the ecosystem is drastically decreased in terms of its stability and its efficiency. So we've got the beaver, who's an ecosystem engineer. They actually create a pond where there used to be flowing water. We have the wolf who acts as an apex predator, keeping herbivore populations in check, keeping them from defoliating the forest. And then we have the otter who also acts as an apex predator, just like the wolf. All right, on to unit three, we need to know generalists and specialists. Remember, generalists uh, are really advantage in all sorts of ecosystems because they have really wide habitat and food needs, whereas specialists like the koala sadly need really, really narrow resources and they're not able to thrive in most places. Our selected species are going to produce tons and tons of offspring, give very little care to them. Case selected species like elephants are going to produce only a few offspring, give them a ton of care. This could be a great potential question about a problem, an environmental problem of our or case selected species. Case selected species are really prone to extinction, so that's going to be a problem. We have carrying capacity, so we've got this little graph here that shows a population going up and up and up. Then eventually, though, we know when a population exceeds its carrying capacity or the maximum number of individuals that it can support, it's going to crash. So there could be a die off. So there's a great look at what a problem related to carrying capacity could be overshoot and die off. Then we have an age structure diagram that's going to tell us just the proportion of individuals in a population that are of each age cohort. Remember, cohorts just a group of people. This example here would be an age diagram that would indicate tons of growth because there's so many individuals that are in the pre-reproductive age cohort at the bottom. So that could give us an environmental problem in the future of overconsumption or of increased carbon footprint or increased resource needs. So think about the implications that each of these topics have for potential problems and then the solutions to those problems. Then we have TFR. TFR is total fertility rate, total number of children that a woman will have in her lifetime. It is decreasing globally over time, but it's a big proxy for measuring the kind of impact we're having on the environment because the more people, the greater environmental impact. So there's tons of problems you can find that are directly related to TFR. And then finally, we have demographic transition, which is just a theory that predicts that as countries develop, they will move from subsistence economies where residents are typically using biofuels and growing most of their own food to nations that have more industrialized economies that have better access to healthcare, clean water, medication. And of course, that's going to make them more affluent. So they will be more wealthy. The other problem, though, is as these countries develop, we know that their carbon footprint greatly increases. We know that their resource consumption greatly increases. So there's an environmental problem of development. All right, and we're on to unit four, a personal favorite of mine, very near and dear to my heart. I'll pan the camera down so you can see that I have my stop treating soil like dirt shirt on, uh, one of my favorite units of all. So we've got weathering and erosion. That's just the breakdown of rocks by wind and rain. And then erosion is the transport of those small rock pieces or fragments or even soil from one place to another. Then we have soil fertility. So remember soil fertility is the ability of soil to nourish plant growth. It needs to be able to hold water, so it needs to have good water holding capacity, but also needs to have nutrients. So dead organic matter, humus or manure that's added to soil can really improve its soil fertility because it's going to release nutrients and help retain moisture. Then we've got global wind patterns. This is just a really tri tricky topic to explain quickly. If you think this is a weak point of yours, I would definitely watch that video. Um, long story short, remember your easterlies and westerlies. Wind blows from east to west between 0 and 30, west to east from 30 to 60. And remember, the Coriolis effect is the spinning of the earth, which deflects wind in the opposite direction of Earth's spin. 
Then we have the rain shadow effect, which tells us that warm ocean waters typically will carry a lot of moisture. And then when the prevailing wind brings that warm air onto land from the ocean, what's going to happen is the air is going to rise. We're going to get a lot of rainfall. We're going to get lush green vegetation on the side of the mountain facing the ocean. Whereas we're going to see desert on the side of the mountain that is not facing the ocean. Then we have El Nino and La Nina. This is another one that is just very challenging to explain without actually watching the video. So if you think this is a weak point of yours, I would definitely go check that video out. Um, long story short though, with El Nino and La Nina, um, El Nino is going to bring unseasonably warm weather over to the Americas. It's gonna suppress upwelling. Fisheries are gonna be less productive. There's gonna be more rainfall in the Americas while it's gonna cause more drought and dryness in the uh, Southeast Asia and Australia. And then La Nina is just basically reversing that. So it's even stronger than normal trade winds. Um, that's a topic though, I might consider watching that video. If that comes at you in the exam, that's gonna be very tough to quickly learn information about. So I would watch that video if I were you. Then we have unit five, clear cutting and deforestation. It's gonna to lead to a lot of problems, loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity, soil erosion, loss of carbon sequestration. Um, I suspect that they'll fit clear cutting and deforestation onto a lot of your FRQ questions in one way or another. Uh, then we have pesticides. Remember, those are just chemicals that kill pests. Uh, they have a lot of problems though. They target non-intended species or non-target species and often kill organisms that they're not meant to kill like honeybees or they can cause intersex fish if we're talking about endocrine disruptors getting into streams and rivers. So a lot of unintended consequences of pesticides. And we have mining. So that's the removal of what's called overburden or soil or vegetation that's on top of the ore that the mining company needs to get at. Problems with that are going to be soil erosion, acid mine drainage, particulate matter, you know, carbon release in the form of methane. So strong potential for mining to have a explain an environmental problem, propose or justify a solution there. Um, urbanization and runoff. Again, this is a really strong possibility to come up on the exam. They really focused on mitigating runoff or reducing runoff as a whole kind of topic in unit five. And so remember that public transportation can mitigate runoff because you have fewer cars on the road. And so there are less pollutants getting onto the road because of that. Rain gardens are a great example permeable pavements, another great example. And urbanization also could be a prime topic for a proposed solution because we have urban sprawl, which is the spreading of cities out further and further, which converts natural landscape to non-natural landscape, urban landscape. And so think about smart planning, think about urban growth boundaries as solutions there. Then we have sustainable agriculture, another example of one that is just too big to really do any justice to in a 30 second review format like this. Um, but I have the little poop emoji there for manure, use organic fertilizer because it releases nutrients more slowly instead of synthetic fertilizer, which causes eutrophication. Remember algae blooms and hypoxia. And we've got the ladybug as a biocontrol. This is a natural predator that could be brought in to eat pests instead of spraying pesticides. That would be part of integrated pest management as well. And then we have a little plant there to symbolize that you could use cover crops even to kind of protect your soil in the season that you're not growing crops so that it doesn't just get eroded and get degraded. So again, sustainable agriculture, if you're gonna watch one video here, that one might be worth your time, um, that along with urbanization and runoff. Unit six, energy. Again, this is a major, major topic that I think is going to come up in some way or shape, in some way, shape or form on a lot of your FRQs. So we have fossil fuels, that's a really important topic. Of course, that's oil, coal, natural gas. The big problem there is the release of greenhouse gases. So this is the prime driver behind climate change. Something like 80% or more of all the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. So big potential for an FRQ question there. Renewable energy, there are a lot of different sources. That video will walk you through pros and cons of them. Big thing we need to know though is that they are replenishable so they can continually be reused without degrading or depleting them. Then we have biomass. Biomass is just the use of a biological substance for fuel. So it could be wood. And you should know that developing nations are often using biomass as subsistence fuel, meaning they're using it to heat their home and cook their food with because they just don't have access to commercial sources like natural gas or propane. Then we have nuclear energy. Again, a really big topic that's hard to get into in 30 seconds. 
drawbacks of it are going to be the potential for a meltdown if there is not proper oversight. Uh, you can't really dispose of the waste. It remains radioactive for thousands and thousands of years. And that's a human health hazard because it causes cancer. So there's the potential for explaining an environmental problem of nuclear. And then finally, we have any energy conservation. So this could be great for proposing a solution to any of these problems, because when we conserve energy, we reduce our need for all of these fuel sources, which reduces the environmental problems that they cause. So how do we conserve energy? We can buy smarter appliances that just decrease the amount of energy total that they need to run. We can have a smart grid that better times the implementation of our different energy sources. We can use more renewable energies, a better mix that allow us to take more coal-fired power plants offline. So all of these things can kind of be solutions to reducing the environmental impacts of energy. And then finally, we're gonna bring it home here with Unit 7. And the first topic on Unit 7 that I think is really important is particulate matter. So remember, this is just a fancy word for dust, basically, or really any particle that could be in the air. And your go-to answer here, it is a respiratory irritant. It can inflame the lungs. It can worsen asthma and bronchitis, drive up healthcare costs. Then we have smog. Smog is going to be, in this case, photochemical smog. So it's going to come heavily from nitrogen dioxide coming from car emissions. Then when that hits the sunlight, it's going to be converted into photochemical smog. That's going to lower visibility. It's going to be a human health risk because it's going to be a respiratory irritant. So a lot of problems there. If we want to reduce that, if we want to think about a solution to propose, we have to limit driving or we have to enact, or we have to enact stricter fuel efficiency standards. Public transport is a great way to combat smog. Then we have acid rains. Remember, that's going to come from NOx and SOx emissions. They're going to react with sunlight and water in the atmosphere to become nitric acid and sulfuric acid. They're going to dissolve into precipitation that falls to the ground. And that's a great opportunity for an explain a problem because that's going to lower the pH of both soil and water that it falls on. Remember, lowering pH makes it more acidic. That's going to make toxic metals like aluminum and mercury more soluble in the water or the soil, which can kill organisms that live there. And we have NOx and SOx, very important pollutants that get their whole separate video there if you want to check that out. Remember, they're precursors to acid rain. They can also be respiratory irritants. NOx can contribute to smog. So really important pollutants to be aware of. And then finally, reducing air pollutants. That video is going to walk you through a ton of solutions to use to combat different air pollutants. So there we have it. That's all seven units that are going to be on the exam. As I went through the course and exam description, the you know 200 and some page PDF that the College Board put out on all the topics, those were the five that from each unit I thought were the most important and the most likely to be an FRQ. Now I've heard from teachers of other subjects that students are getting different FRQs. So it's highly likely that you and many of your friends at the same school do not get the same FRQ. So just one final reminder, do not cheat, do not Snapchat or TikTok or whatever you do to communicate with your friends. Um, chances are they don't even have the same exam. And so it would be a waste of time anyway. So that being said, I really feel pretty strongly that a lot of these topics are going to be on your FRQs, like I said, in some way, shape, or form. So just be ready to explain an environmental problem in three key facts, step by step. Be ready to propose a solution. Describe specifically how your solution mitigates or reduces the negative environmental consequences. And then most importantly, don't stay up super late tonight cramming. You know, if you want to spend some time tomorrow watching maybe one video within each of these seven units to try to cover all your bases, that would probably be worth your time. But don't stay up all night. Definitely don't try to watch every single video. Just get a good eight hours, get a good solid meal tomorrow and stay calm. You got this.